Uh, so the, the theme of the next talk, anyway, is the Sinn Féin revolution in East Tyrone. And basically what it's about is the period after 1916, after the 1916 Rising, really up until about 1920, and how Sinn Féin became the dominant political force within Tyrone nationalism. There were some uh, strange creatures from the unionist community who joined the Irish Volunteers around the conscription crisis, but they didn't tend to do it in great numbers. So the two blocks, unionist and nationalist, remained pretty much the same. But within the nationalist, what you would call the nationalist uh, cohort, there was a seismic shift really away from constitutional nationalism towards republicanism, or what Sinn Féin, Sinn Féin as a popular front uh, movement, represented, I'll probably go into a wee bit more in tonight's talk. I'll break it down in terms of trying to explain how Sinn Féin took over from the Irish Parliamentary Party and the nature of this change and what Sinn Féin really represented. And I'll talk about it from several different perspectives and then I'll, I'll give my own perspective. Uh, and anyone who's been to my talk before will probably realise that it'll probably be from a Marxist perspective. And it will analyse it in, in terms of class. So the, the next talk is about the revolution, the Irish revolution in East Rome and, and Rome more generally. And it, it hinges really on what we understand by revolution. So within Irish historiography, that's more or less most of the stuff written on this period inside the main universities in Ireland. There's a very deliberate attempt to try and minimise the nature of the revolutionary change or the prospect of revolutionary change in Ireland at the time. The, the, the main argument really is, is that very little really changed. That in many respects Sinn Féin was a very conservative revolution, Sinn Féin's revolution was a very conservative revolution and the, the historical figure most closely associated with this perspective is Kevin O'Higgins who was, although he was never a uh, leader of the 26 counties or the Free State Government, he was perhaps the most talented and politically important figure uh, within that government for his assassination and he says that that we Sinn Féin carried out a revolution, but we were the most conservative revolutionaries ever. My argument would be, looking at it from the perspective of history below, that yes, there was a very conservative outcome to the Irish Revolution, but that actually for a small period between 1816 and the onset of the Irish Civil War uh, in 1922, there were trends within Irish society which hinted towards a far more revolutionary and radical change. And I look at the revolutionary period from that perspective, and I've examined Sinn Féin and Tyrone from that perspective. And in many respects, this links in the tradition of British Marxist historians like E.P. Thompson and viewing ordinary people's uh, engagement in revolution and what it meant for them. So I very much adhere to this gentleman's uh, definition of revolution. And uh, this is Leon Trotsky, who was at the same time the Sinn Féin revolution was going on, he was carrying out or been a very uh, prominent part in the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. And he says that the most uh, indubitable feature of a revolution is a direct interference of the masses in historical events. In ordinary times, the state, be it monarchical or democratic, elevates itself above the nation and history is made by specialists in that line of business. Kings, ministers, bureaucrats, parliamentarians, journalists, I suppose you could say spin doctors, uh, special advisors, uh, lobbyists, the political class. Trotsky's point was that, but at those cru crucial moments when the old order becomes no longer endurable to the masses, they break over the barriers, excluding them from the political arena, sweep aside their traditional representatives, and create by their own interference the initial groundwork for a new regime. Now, this regime, typically within history, tends to go through a revolutionary protest and rebound itself and become counter revolutionary. But the history of a revolution is for us, first of all, a history of the forceful entrance of the masses into the realm of rulership over their own destiny. And this is essentially what happens in Ireland after 1916. Irish politics had very much settled uh, into Irish politics before the 1916 rising, and more uh, importantly before the outbreak of the First World War and the Ulster crisis that directly preceded it, was a very settled political landscape. It was a political landscape, the contours of which were more or less set by an earlier social revolution in the late 1870s and throughout the 1880s, which emerged from the Irish Land War. And the main political organisation that emerged through this previous revolutionary period 
was the Irish Parliament in Party, which sat out, as Michael David famously called it, as a semi revolutionary organisation and turned into pure pornalism. Uh, David meant by pure pornalism was a purely parliamentary form of uh, nationalist movement, but th th that it had revolutionary antecedents. By, by, this, by the Home Rule Crisis and the First World War, the party that emerged from the previous tumultuous period of the Land War, the Irish Parliamentary Party, was very much a settled part of the political establishment of Westminster. And the leadership, with the exception of a man who talk about called Joe Devon, very much came from this part of pardon like generation. John Redmond, John Dillon and people like that there. The onset of three specific crises in Irish history, the Ulster Crisis, the First World War, and then the 1916 raising, which is essentially as a result of the combination of the Ulster Crisis and the First World War, ruptures this political consensus. But the 1916 raising in and of itself does not constitute a revolution. It's the intention for revolution. And what follows it really is a period where revolutionary impulses within Irish society find their feet. Okay? So the, the popular perception that you know 16 people were shot in May 1916 and then all of a sudden the next morning everybody was a robot of Republicanism, a Republican and Sinn Féin was operating out of Harcourt Street in Dublin and you know the rest is history. It doesn't really convey the reality of how historical change happens. Now this concept of revolution sits very much against much of the tenure and tone of historiographical treatment of the Sinn Féin Revolution. The treatment of the Sinn Féin Revolution within Irish historiography is typified by David Fitzpatrick's classic study on the Sinn Féin, the Sinn Féin Revolution in County Clare, in which he described Sinn Féin as old home rule wine decanted in new bottles. And essentially nothing really changed. And his perspective about Trotsky's idea about ordinary people taking part in popular politics is very much conveyed by his uh, description of popular mobilisation. By the sporadic exercise of force majeure, by interference in public assemblies, arrests, trials and imprisonments, the castle, Dublin Castle Authority, the RIC, made heroes out of nobodies and provoked savage indignation among countless families which had previously supported the new movement, if at all, only out of herd instinct. So the idea is that the popular masses are essentially uh, stupid and that uh, it was the over zealous nature of the way that Dublin Castle authorities dealt with uh, popular protest after the 1916 raising, which was essentially counterproductive. But that the revolution in and of itself wasn't a particularly revolutionary revolution. Okay. Now, how I'm going to argue the case, perhaps against Fitzpatrick's thesis, is that a lot of people who were alive during this revolution speak through some uh, tape recordings. And the the main person who's going to be speaking tonight is no longer with us, it's Maud Nick Kelly, who was a very young girl during 1916 and then had just turned 11 by the time really Sinn Féin comes to prominence in Throne uh, around 1920. All right. So she, she, I interviewed Mother Benignus in 2005 and it was on a, an old tape recording and I digitised it and stuff. But uh, some people I'm sure here knew Mother Benignus, but the people who don't didn't know Mother Benignus, I would say that. She was a very sharp individual, and very intelligent, and she knew how to put young historical researchers in their place. So I'm gonna. Well, yes, but there was also a number of people who came to Sinn Féin after 1916. Do you remember any of those people? That's the name. You would want to know. Whether. <laughs> You know, how big of a change there was? Oh, there was a. There was a you get that from the result of the election. From the result of the election. Yeah, that. No problem. Yeah, there's no problem there. Huh? I will turn. The people turned. And then they came to the, the treaty. So if I actually cut across what the point was trying to make there, I asked her who were the, these new people who went into Sinn Féin, Féin and she told me she wouldn't put that in a book. And then I asked her, well, it might be very interesting. She says, well, do you make one read a book then? And then, so, uh, so the main, the, the real value of oral testimony like this, even though there's a massive gap in terms of time and memory, is that the subjective opinions that people who were alive at the time developed during that period 
stayed with them. And if you triangulate this with primary sources, you get a great insight into how people felt during the period and then the recollections and the way that they remembered the period. So occasionally when I'm trying to make a point, I'll dip in and I'll, I'll uh, talk a wee bit or I'll get Mother Benignus and uh, earn my money easily the night I'll get somebody else who, uh, who can't uh, answer for herself anymore to do the talk from her. Uh, but the, the main point of this talk, and, and it was mentioned in the, the previous clip, is that there appeared to be a sea change, or as Mother Benignus put it, the people turned. And they're, they're, she viewed it as very much a popular uprising and a, a popular impulse towards dramatic social change. Now, this is probably... The people turned. The people rose, as it were, and their ethnicity. Okay, so what, what is this change? This change is really the abandonment of traditional parliamentary constitutional nationalism and the acceptance of Sinn Féin and Sinn Féin's programme. And we'll talk about what Sinn Féin's programme was and how they achieved it. Now the way that I analyse this is, is the, the person in the middle is a, is a fellow from Italy called Antonio Gramsci. He's a, he, he was a, a Marxist and he developed a theory called hegemony. Now I'm not going to bore you with Marxist theory, but the, the really important thing is, is that my big argument is that Sinn Féin set out really as a not very well or fully formed political movement. It arose out of circumstances and out of potentially revolutionary circumstances. Where then different classes and groups in Irish society came together, they welded themselves together under the umbrella of Sinn Féin, which presented itself very much as a popular front movement for full Irish independence. But that inside Sinn Féin, my argument would be that what Gramsci would call the hegemonic class was very much a petty bourgeois or lower middle class uh, group who had been previously excluded from political power by the traditional Irish parliamentary party. And if you want the personification of this, you could pick Game and Delaware himself. Okay. Other historians have called them an overeducated outgroup. Now, no class is able to gain the support of the masses through a narrow appeal to their own interests. So, hegemony is a way that a particular class and group in society uses ideology, the way that people think, to try and generate support. He says that a hegemonic class, the, the most important class and the ruling class in society, transcends its own class interests. And it voices the aims and interests of other classes to become universal representatives. All right? So that their message has a national popular as well as a class dimension. And my big argument was that, in very crude terms, and it was more nuanced than this, a very well established and conservative and upper middle class and, and very wealthy uh, Irish parliamentary party uh, leadership was subverted by a, a, a lower middle class petty bourgeois and some elements of the working class within Sinn Féin. And the way that they did this was that they revised the ideology or the way that people thought about nationalism. But they couldn't do this, they couldn't come in and completely redesign nationalism. What they did was they, they subordinated previous elements of the Irish Parliamentary Party's nationalist platform and they elevated other elements. Or they challenged the Irish Party's claims to these different elements of their platform and this is how they communicated their message and this is how they gained what it would be called a hegemonic or dominant position uh, <coughs> within an Irish civil society so that's not to do with the government now an integral state a fully formed state is when these hegemonic classes control the state and civil society Sinn Féin controlled civil society first then it challenged the state and the state was in the control of the British government and that's then where the controversy of races. But prior to Sinn Féin even challenging the British government, they had to prove that they represented Irish civil society or the best part of Irish civil society. And they essentially do, do this in December 1918 in the British general election. When they uh, gained 74 out of 105 Irish seats. Uh, and uh, they have a majority vote or a, a mandate as they see it for the formation of an Irish Republic. So what this talk is about is the manner in which one consensus that had been created a generation earlier, the Irish Parliamentary Party's consensus, was destroyed in a crisis. The crisis brought on by Home Rule, the war, in 1916. So if you look at this brick wall, these are the different elements of the Irish Parliamentary Party's consensus. 
the de they had Devlinite leadership, this is Joe Devlin and Belfast. They had the Catholic hierarchy on their side, the medium clergy, the constitutional separatists, these people who viewed home rule as a means to an end towards perhaps a for fuller form of freedom. They had the lower middle class, they had Irish, a lot of the Irish Ireland movement, people who were interested in the regeneration of the Irish language. They had the ancient order of Hibernians. They had elements of the labour movement, they had the ordinary Hib supporters, and they had the wider Catholic community generally. Okay? Outside this consensus, there were two main groups. There was a very radical Republican group called the Irish Republican Brotherhood. And in Tyrone, there was actually a group of even more conservative, uh, very wealthy Catholics, who described themselves as Heliates, and it was like a faction or a splinter group from the Irish Parliamentary Party who followed two very prominent national politicians. One of them was Tim Healy, who was essentially the political representative of William Martin Murphy, the uh, owner of the Dublin Tramway Company and the Irish Independent, and the man who uh, very famously locked out Dublin workers in 1913, and another man, William O'Brien, from Cork. Now, together, William O'Brien and Tim Healy formed an organisation called the All for Ireland League, which was very much the representative uh, of uh, the Dublin business elite and the business elite in Cork, and the very, very higher echelons of the Catholic clergy. The ironic thing about the Sinn Féin revolution is that rather than this Republican IRB group becoming what I would argue is the dominant class within the, the Sinn Féin revolution, in fact, the dominant class that emerges out of the Sinn Féin revolution through the acceptance of the treaty and the beginning of the Irish Civil War is actually the Heliates. And Kevin O'Higgins, who would have nothing to do with republicanism before 1916 and actually thought that the Irish Parliamentary Party was too nationalistic, becomes a member of Sinn Féin and then later becomes the, perhaps the dominant figure within the Free State Government. So, you know, not all revolutions end up with revolutionary outcomes. This is essentially what happens. There's a crisis, we call it an organic crisis. And if you want to try and understand what was going on in Throne and going on across Ireland, but this is more specific to Ulster, you can imagine that this consensus was locked, was knocked down by these three events, principally by 1916. And here's the pile of bricks, and here's the two boys who are trying to pick the bricks up and rebuild the consensus. So there's a new party called Sinn Féin, and it picks Sinn Féin the guts of a year and a half to probably establish itself by its ordination in 1917. And it emerges from different elements of the previous constitutional nationalist consensus coming to terms with Republicans to try and create a counter movement to the Irish Parliamentary Party. The Irish Parliamentary Party itself, uh, as another famous historical figure said, had not the way, you know. And uh, they, try to re they try to maintain their position. Now, the leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party in Ulster is a man from Belfast called Joe Devlin. He's actually his parents are actually from Arbo. Uh, and the reason why he's wearing a green sash is because he was the leader of the ancient order of Ibernians. And the ancient order of Ibernians were very, very powerful in Ulster. They were like, you could call them a political mirror image of the Orange Order. They, they, they were specifically sectarian in terms of their intake. You had to be a Catholic to be a member of the ancient order of Ibernian. And they fulfilled a very similar role to the Orange Order in terms of creating the popular base for constitutional nationalism and very much in the same way that the Orange Order created the popular base for Ulster Unionism. These two rival groups invade for the political allegiance of the nationalist community in Throne from 1916 onwards. 1916 and the rising is key to this, but another fundamentally important issue is what Joe Devlin and the constitutional nationalist leadership do in June, uh, really the month after the executions, is that in a very important meeting on the 20th of June in St Mary's Hall in Belfast, Joe Dad, and this leads to the disintegration really of the constitutional nationalist movement in Throne, with the people who remain loyal to Joe Devlin and the leader of constitutional nationalist, John Redmond, centred really around Cookstown, around the nationalist population of Cookstown, and then other elements who previously were loyal to the constitutional nationalist movement abandon uh, Devlin and side with these Heliates and they set up their own organisation and by degree these Heliates and these what I would call constitutional separatists find common cause with the Republicans who were always particularly strong in this county and it's from that new consensus or new grouping that Sinn Féin emerged in Tyrone. So if you so if aren't sufficiently confused by brick walls and wheelbars and all this carry on, uh, I'll proceed. Okay. So try, try and think of it like there used to be a consensus 
There used to be different groups who found common cause on their constitutional and nationalist umbrella. The most important organisation in Throne for keeping that thing glued together was the Ancient Order of Hibernians. A crisis comes and breaks that consensus up, and the dominant issues in the crisis are in 1816, and because of 1816, the acceptance of partition by constitutional nationalism. This leads to the fragmentation of it. It takes about a year for the rival Sinn Féin party or movement to find its feet and to challenge constitutional nationalism then in Throne. And this is what the, 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 the revolution is about. Now, I mentioned before this idea about hegemony or ideology. These sound like very, already 40 very big words, but essentially what it means is control and control through the way that people think about politics and society and the world. That's what ideology is. You can really identify three, well, there's probably five, but I'll do four for tonight. Four main platforms and arguments and this struggle between constitutional nationalism, the Irish Parliamentary Party, John Redmond and Joe Devlin, and this new movement, Sinn Féin, was fought out on this terrain. The first one was the who were the inheritors of the Fenian tradition. Now you might think it's a very obvious question that was Sinn Féin, but for a long time before uh, 1916, whenever the Irish Parliamentary Party was founded by Charles Stuart Burnell, something like a third of the MPs were former Fenians. The Irish Parliamentary Party emerged during a social revolution in Ireland that emerged from an agreement between the most radical elements of constitutional nationalism and perhaps the most uh, non doctrinaire elements of republicanism. And the name of this was the New Departure, where Charles Stuart Parnell, uh, John Devay in America, and Michael Davitt came together and decided to use the land issue as a means to progress national independence. So for a long time, the Irish Parliamentary Party actually uh, claimed that it was the inheritor and the successor of the Fenian tradition. And for a long time, a lot of people believed this. And if you look at the flag of the Irish National uh, Irish Parliamentary Party, it's the old Fenian flag. The harp and no crown, Aaron Le Bra, written underneath it. They celebrated the anniversary of the Manchester Martyrs. They used very nationalistic and quasi-republican language during the, the centenary of the 1798 rebellion in Tyrone. It was the most popular element of the Constitutional Nationalist Party with Joe Devlin uh, in the vanguard, as you could speak, who seized control of throne nationalism and hold a grip on throne nationalism for the Irish party until 1918. Okay, so that's really important. The second big issue, and this is still a big issue today, is abstention. Abstention from Westminster. So Colin Eastwood and Michelle O'Neill didn't uh, start this disagreement. Okay, this is a long standing policy, not a Republican policy, but a policy of Sinn Féin. And Sinn Féin itself uh, was first articulated by Arthur Griffith in 1904 in a booklet called The Resurrection of Hungary, where he borrowed an awful lot of the thoughts of an earlier uh, radical Irish nationalist man called James Fitton Lawler, who argued for a campaign of passive resistance as opposed to armed insurrection against British rule in Ireland as the best way of trying to achieve freedom. Griffith adopted these ideas about passive resistance and uh, made a comparison between what Ireland's position would be and the position of Austria and Hungary under the Austro-Hungarian Empire in that they had the same king or emperor in the uh, Austrian case but they had separate completely autonomous parliaments. That was a false analogy. But this idea about that Irish MPs would get elected and then would abstain from Westminster and then with elected local councillors would form what was called the National Assembly or National Council and then would refuse to uh, acknowledge British rule was essentially on the political agenda from 1904 onwards. Within the realms of popular politics, it didn't achieve an awful lot of support, and we'll see why. The third point is who were the champions of Ireland, Irish Ireland? Before 1916, the Irish Parliamentary Party had, to many respects, paid lip service to the Irish language, but it had demonstrated some support for the Irish language. The campaign of the Conrad and the Gillig, or the Gillig League, gained some support within the Irish Parliamentary Party. Uh, uh, the, the essential qualification of Ireland for matriculation in the Irish National, or what was called the Irish Catholic University at the time, UCD, was one of the main uh, sort of symbols of this support by the Irish Parliamentary Party. After 1916, essentially, the Irish Parliamentary Party lose 
uh, Irish Ireland and the, the cultural revival as an ideological means to gain support and Sinn Féin very much hold a monopoly on this. In fact, what I talked about earlier about changing or putting different emphasis on strands of nationalism, Sinn Féin very much viewed the revival of the Irish language as a symbol of the revival of the country. And the Sinn Féin revolution and the way that people mobilised themselves was very much through the agencies of Cullinan and the Gaelic League. And Keeley's and Irish language classes, and we'll see, were incredibly important in terms of this brief period of mobilisation throughout the room that ended very abruptly, for obvious reasons, which we'll talk about as well. And then the fourth point is imperialism, or as I put it here, which flag? The tricolour of the green flag, or as they called it in the room at the time, the butcher's apron, which was the, which was the flag of each party. The Irish party said theirs was the green flag, the Sinn Féiners said because of Redmond's support for the British war effort and his support for imperialism, that he was no longer a nationalist. And this was particularly important because in the period before the First World War, the Irish parliamentary party elite have moved, were beginning to move away from a very advanced and stringent type of nationalist rhetoric at home towards a more conciliatory approach towards imperialism. Now, the anti-imperialist position of this would be that they were trying to carve out a niche or a place at the high imperial table. The more uh, moderate analysis of the Irish party's position was that they were trying to increase conciliation in Ireland and to generate a consensus, an acceptable consensus with Britain in which Irish self-government under home rule wouldn't be posed a threat to British wider British imperial interests. More people listened to the second argument before the First World War than when the First World War began because as the horrors of the First World War unfolded and it became very clear that there was a high price to be paid for support for the British Empire uh, and then after the executions uh, of the 1916 leaders and the conduct of the Dublin Castle authorities afterwards a lot of the main thrust and uh, impact of the Irish Party and Party's pro-imperial argument lost it's, it's luster, so to speak. And more people began to listen to Sinn Féin and the Republicans' anti-imperialism, which they had been consistently espousing uh, throughout the period. So, this is essentially what happens. And the best way of doing this is to try and think that in Tyrone you have about 500 members of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, even before 1916. In fact, had it not been for this man, Patrick McCartan, it's probably very likely that these people would have mobilised and took part in, in the 1916 raising, but it was called off. This man is Dennis McCullough, who was the leader of the Irish Republican Brotherhood in Belfast, he was also the president of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, who didn't actually know that the Irish Republican Brotherhood were going to have an Easter raising until Palm Sunday, because Tom Clark and Sean McDermott didn't tell him. But uh, McCullough had been involved in Republican politics at Ulster since 1905. He had been involved in Republican politics in Throne for the same length of time. In 1905 he had visited Throne and tried to promote the Sinn Féin policy through what were called the Dungannon Clubs. And obviously he had been in Throne an awful lot. He had been thrown on Easter Sunday 1916 as part of the IRB's infiltration and use of the Irish Volunteer Movement. He comes back to Throne after spending a period in jail after the 1916 rising, which he actually got shot himself in the hand so it was the only shot that was fired in Ulster. Uh, when he came back, he got involved in the organisation of Sinn Féin and he visited Kalaimut. And this is what he said about the development of Republican politics. He said about 10 or 12 years ago, so he's talking about the Dungannon clubs in Sinn Féin. He visited this town. In those days, a very small minority were able to grapple with the ideals for which they stood. That's code for saying that the Hibernians and Kalaimut chased them out with pitchforks and... Uh, revolvers and told him and Sean McDermott that they weren't welcome in very uh, clear terms. They believed that they must work through the night and they would come here here. They were there about 18 months ago with the Irish volunteers and if their advice had been taken a different story would have been told in East Rome. The flag of Irish nationality was, nationality was planted on its top mast by the men of East Rome and they were there that day to further that propaganda and see that the flag was kept there and never would be lowered. And this is the formation of the first Sinn Féin Club. Kalaimut. And the Sinn Féin, first Sinn Club, Sinn Féin Club in Kalaimut and the Ungannon and most of East Rome are initially based on the existing Republican constituency, the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Where the Irish Republican Brotherhood wasn't strong, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. But these Republicans 
play a key role in the development of Sinn Féin, as everybody would expect. But my argument would be that in terms of the political, where political power rested in Sinn Féin, they played a subordinate role. That they had essentially been the mainstay of Republican politics since Don Clark was initiated into the Fenians. Uh, and that when it came to, to the, a popular front movement based on these Republican principles, they actually took a subordinate role in that political movement than another group within the throne society. But it's, undoubt, it's undoubted, or there's, there's no real doubt really, that these people played a, still played a formative and an incredibly important role in the creation of Sinn Féin and throne. And it's because of their link to 1916 and the way that 1916 changed people's opinion. In 1918, was a, the, the country turned after the execution. So this man here was the leader of Republican, uh, Republican thrones, Dr. Patrick McCartan. Now, Patrick McCartan was in Furford Jail. He was actually in the Irish News last week, but he wasn't in the Irish News last week. Him and Phoenix had his 100-year report where he was appointed a Spanish doctor in Gorton 100 years ago last week, where he was in Furford Prison. He was arrested after the 1916 rising. As I say, throughout East Room there was a very strong tradition of republicanism and there was a very, very strong network of working class republicans. These people played a formidable role in the creation and formation of Sinn Féin clubs, but I would argue that they weren't uh, the dominant element. As I've already pointed out, I'm going to talk about the four groups in their own. So the, the group that I suppose just came here thinking was going to talk about, I'll talk about, but I'll talk about a few pe other people as well. So the republicans are really important in the creation and formation of this Republican Party. Thank you very much. The second group that are really important are the main adversaries to Sinn Féin, and that's the Devonites, the Hibernians. Now, Devlin's decision to support partition really damages them in Tyrone, but they still have a formidable organisation in parts of the counties, and it takes a while, really, for them to lose that mass support that had been there for 25 years at least, okay, since the late 1890s. So why is Devlin a very f formidable adversary for this new Republican movement? The first one is its continued political relevance. Unlike John Redmond, unlike John Dillon, he is not from the Parnley generation. He's a relatively young man. He understands Irish society. He understands the changes in Irish society. And he, very much before the outbreak of the First World War, was viewed as the natural successor to Redmond as the leader of constitutional nationalism. He's a formidable political opponent. He holds mastery of the Northern AOH. There are 8,000 members of the aged Lord of Ibernians in Tyrone. And he's the president of the Board of Iron, which is the branch that most Tyrone or Ibernian uh, are affiliated to. Okay. East Tyrone is the ramparts of Devlin's territory. So East Tyrone is essentially where Devlin's influence stops after 1916. Okay, there's patches of Hibernian support in places like Rafoe because of Bishop O'Donnell and stuff and, and Derry City and stuff. But in terms of moving west from Belfast, because of this issue of partition, Devlin's influence, although the M1 wasn't there at the time, stops at the M1. Okay? And uh, the social and ideolo the ideological ties to the pocket demosthenes. Now he's called the pocket demosthenes because I would have looked like a basketball player next to him. Okay, he's very small, and he was called the Mothenese after the great Greek order. He was an incredibly powerful public speaker, all right? And he had created a network of patronage through the ancient order of Ibernians, where an awful lot of the chief party men in the, 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 the county, who had positions in local government, and who were merchants and traders for the most part, viewed support for Dadlin and for the Hibernians as their bread and butter. The best example of this is he's came back earlier from Six Main Town or Six Main Cross. Uh, so the there are very, very powerful reasons why Devlin was a formidable opponent for Sinn Fein. But because of the issue of partition, the dissolution and the fragmentation of constitutional nationalism happens in Ulster before it happens very much in the rest of the country, because the party accepts partition. And these are the other two groups. Now I will quickly talk about the, the main re another main reason for uh, the abandonment of Devlinism, and that's support for the war and the change in nationalist opinion about support for the war and imperialism, because that's one of the things that I mentioned earlier. Uh, th this is uh, Devlin's speech in Dungannon, 
in November 1914. Uh, but he was there with William Archer Redmond, who was MP for his throne at the time, and also the son of John Redmond, the leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party. Now, Devlin and Redmond are Nilgannon because Nilgannon is, is really the centre of the opposition to the Irish Parliamentary Party in the Irish Volunteer Force in this period, and this is why they have this rally. And it's to address uh, the split within the Irish Volunteers in Dungannon. And I'll, I'll talk about this here because it, it touches on the issue, issue of imperialism. And he says, When critics and cranks and sceptics and fault finders and good for nothings threw stones, so he's talking about local Republicans there, and they're probably in the audience. Uh, he says, When England has done Ireland justice, then let Ireland be just at England. I have never in the past, I do not now, and I never will in the future, sound the note of national compromise, nor will I agree to lower the national flag. If England is our enemy, then England must be fought, but if England is our friend, then we must act in the spirit of friendship and goodwill towards England. Until those gentlemen who are now assailing Irish leaders, again these are the local Republicans, were prepared to go out on the hillsides or along the shores of Ireland and successfully combat the British Army, remember this is two years before the 1916 Rising, and the British Navy, they could never hope to win for Ireland what has been won for her in the bloodless revolution of the past 30 years. This is an appeal to the record of the Irish Parliamentary Party. They looked across to Australia and they saw a nation glorious in the fullness of its liberty. There was nothing detracted from the power and greatness by belonging to an empire, which was Australia's as well as England's. They looked to Canada, overflowing with prosperity and genuine national pride, glorying in the empire because it was Canada's empire as well as England's. They were not the slaves of England. If they were loyal to the empire, they were partners in its greatness and strength. And this is the change in tone within constitutional nationalist message at the beginning of the Second World War. This war was for the salvation of Belgium, for the liberty of Poland, and the advancement and promotion of high Christian and humane ideas against an, an aggression that, if applied to Ireland, would set her back a century. Human liberty to him was the same everywhere, but England waged war on South Africa, then, yeah, this is a, a, a mention in the Boer War, then nationalists risked delaying their own freedom for 20 years because they took the side of the Boers. And he would take the same side tomorrow if the same issues were involved. He was on the side of England, but England was defending Belgium because if Belgium was crushed, the liberty of a small people was strangled. Who were going to stand aside and look on silently with these brave men with no interest to serve but devotion to their proud of the country, the wonder of the world in peace and the glory of the world in war, struggle for national existence and there's cheers for Belgium. So these are the main planks of the Irish party's position in terms of the British Empire. Ireland will get self-government, it will be an equal partner in empire and Ireland will therefore benefit from empire. Ireland are supporting Britain in the war for poor little Catholic Belgium. There's not really little mention of the fact that Belgium was a major imperial power and was responsible for the death of about 11 million people in the Congo but that's another story for another night. But the main planks of this argument gradually fall because of the longevity of the war, growing hostility to the war, the threat of conscription, and of course 1916. So this goes back to this point in the coalition cabinet in May 1915, which Redmond refuses to take a place on because he knows he's going to face criticism at home but Carson and Craig take places on Carson in particular. This coalition cabinet then introduced conscription. Conscription is introduced in Britain in January 1916, and it's the threat of conscription that convinces an awful lot of erstwhile supporters of the Irish party to switch sides and to go for Sinn Féin. And the conscription crisis of April 1918 is another pivotal event in the emergence of Sinn Féin and in the uh, decline of the Irish parliamentary party. So they, they claimed that Redmond had abandoned through Pornelite nationalism. Now, through Pornelite nationalism never really existed, that there was an independent Irish nationalist party, and that, that Redmond was too close to the British establishment was the answer, was the argument of these, these constitution separatists. There was a... a an, an ideological battle really waged in terms of what the British Empire represented. Was the British Empire a force for civilization and a force for good in the world, which was what Redmond and Devon's argument was, or was it a force for exploitation and oppression, which was the, the traditional Republican argument? And this idea about poor little Catholic Belgium becomes particularly important because the war was meant to be in defence of the freedom of small nations. Yet Ireland was a small nation, Sinn Féin vote 
uh, in, or the Irish people vote for a republic in 1918, the British government deny Ireland the right to self-determination, but implement self-determination throughout much of Eastern Europe in the form of possession of the Austro-Hungarian and the German empires. So this is a key point as well. Now, whose was the policy of pointless violence? So remember Joe Devlin talking about going to the hillside and taking on the British Navy and you know this pointless Republican violence? This idea, constitutional nationalism, had been previously based on the idea. Donald O'Connor or Daniel O'Connor says that the freedom of Ireland was not worth the shedding of one drop of human blood. This had been the constitutional argument for almost a hundred years that republicanism was a, a an ideology or a political movement based on physical force and the constitutional nationalism was based on moral force. But as soon as constitutional nationalism promoted the idea of violence on behalf of the British Empire to engage in um, military activity, it lost much of its previous argument in terms of the dichotomy or the divergence between moral and physical force. The Republicans were able to turn around and say it was not bad to fight Ireland than to be fighting in Flanders or uh, in uh, Gallipoli or other places where an awful lot of Irish soldiers died. Now, the Irish party countered a lot of this by questioning the practicality of the Republican demand. Say that the British Empire is the strongest empire in the world that emerges as the victors in the war, uh, the first global war. And the big argument of the Irish party is how do you think you're going to extract the Republic from the chief imperial military and economic power in the world? These people have defeated the Germans and prepared you know, to lose millions of their own citizens in order to defeat Germany. They think they're going to give the Irish a republic. When the implication for giving the Irish a republic is that you're going to have to grant self-determination and freedom and it's going to lead to the breakup of the British Empire. And then the local uh, constitutional nationalist leader in Throne, a man called John Skeveton. He's originally from Tullyan. He was located here in Dungannon. He was a lawyer stood in for the party in the South Throne constituency in 1918, he basically says that Sinn Féin were madmen. They even be at the So you get, uh, what essentially happens is British policy undermines an awful lot of the constitutional nationalist platform and it tends to reinforce or even to legitimise much of Sinn Féin's argument. We'll, we'll look at that there. Now, the I'll listen, listen to this clip later on, so we'll not listen to it now. Within the previous support base of the constitutional nationalists was a very strong element of what in my book I call constitutional separatism. Right? This is the idea that home rule is a stepping stone. Michael Collins was probably went from being a Republican to a constitutional separatist, the freedom to achieve freedom. You can't defeat the British militarily. There's no point having an insurrection. We gain home rule and incrementally we'll gain full liberation. We'll use constitutional means, but our final objective is complete separation and independence. And a lot of people were content to support constitutional nationalism because the alternative didn't appear to be viable. There appeared to be no viable alternative. So they supported the Irish Parliamentary Party. But at heart, they were separatists. They were looking complete independence. The leadership of the Irish Parliamentary Party were no longer separatists. They wanted self-government, but within the empire. And the, the chief spokesman of this constitutional separatist group in the throne is F.J. O'Connor. He's a solicitor for OMA. Uh, he's linked to the Ulster Herald newspaper. And uh, he's a former Hibernian. And he leaves the party after the party agrees to partition in, in June 1916. He joins up with the Heliates, who we'll talk about now, and he forms a new group called the Irish Nation League to oppose the party. By degree, this Irish Nation League becomes an element of Sinn Féin. And this is what F.J. O'Connor has to say about the British Empire in 1917. He says, What is the British Empire to us, or we to it? Nothing less than nothing. So long as England's attitude remains unchanged, there can be no peace between the two countries. If we must be slaves, we need not cringe to, or fawn upon, and flatter our tyrants. We shall not kiss our chains, nor shall we even pay for the iron out of which they are forged. Now, you cannot understand this change, this dramatic change in the viewpoint of someone who's very well healed, former constitutional nationalist, without the impact of the 1916 raising and the executions. Now, who are these constitutional separatists? And this is from the Belfast newsletter, 
So, uh, in the 26th of June 1916, so the newsletter is not going to be accused of Marxist bias anyway, so there's a fair enough uh, analysis of the inner workings of constitutional nationalism. It says, those who view the matter in this way, those people who ha haven't accepted partition and have left John Redmond's party, are neither Sinn Feiners or O'Brienites. Now, O'Brienites, again, that's Haleyites. That's people who opposed the party before 1916. But men who have hitherto been loyal party men, what they will become as a result of their cleavage, and the cleavage there is a split with Devon, and they weren't uh, transvestites or anything like that there, okay, is somewhat doubtful. Had there been no rebellion, there would have been no Lloyd George scheme, so that's the scheme for partition. But there have been both, and the two are working together to drive the former adherents of Redmondite policy into the camp of extremists. And we get an idea now about what's happening. So, first grouping, Republicans. Second grouping, Devonites, party men. Third grouping, Constitution Separatists. Fourth grouping, Heliates. Now, there's these people have several names. Okay, Heliates, Murnahanites, O'Brienites. Okay, very, very conservative, socially conservative upper middle class, upper class Catholics, linked to the Catholic hierarchy and Cardinal Lowe. Yes, these people become revolutionaries for a couple of years. All right. The chief figure in this group, and now there's some controversy who this is, it's either George Murnahan or Kevin O'Shea. I think it's Kevin O'Shea. Okay. These two men are particularly important. These are two Heliates solicitors from OMA who make common cause with a group of constitutional nationalists and form this new party, the Irish Nation League. And it's an anti-partitionist party. And the reason why they oppose partition is very obvious. Because they've spent 25 years trying to gain control of the patronage that went with local government. And they know that if partition takes place, they'll have no chance of gaining patronage of local government. And this is really going back to the struggle between uh, members of the unionist or orange upper middle class and the struggle between them and members of them, the Catholic or nationalist middle class, for control of local government. So history just goes round circles really, you know. So these people here are by no means revolutionaries, but they end up as the controlling element politically at the national level, the link between Sinn Féin National League and Sinn Féin and Throne. George Murnahan is essentially the leader of Sinn Féin and Throne. Now this is a letter from George Murnahan to George Gavin Duffy, and it's Gavin Duffy here, he's not here, but he was a negotiator of the treaty. And he says, and this is in 1917 before the Irish nation league actually joined Sinn Féin, he says, it will be, I think, better for the country that some nation leaguers should be on the controlling body as a steadying factor. And he joins the stand committee of Sinn Féin. So we can see we have a complete range of opinion from people who have been engaged in Republican politics all their lives, who are intent, who are anti-imperialist and are intent on complete separation and are quite revolutionary, to people who are very, very moderate but, if you want to be cynical, are protecting their own political position and they're moving with political currents. They see the way that the country's turning and they're going in the direction of the country and they're hoping that they can moderate the nature of the new movement. So how do these moderates behave? They behave very moderately. <laughs> is, is, is essentially, they found Sinn Féin clubs and they don't do anything differently from this man, John, John Dillon who is the deputy leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party after John Redmond's death in 1918 he becomes the leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party they had rival meetings in OMA on the same day and both of them cancelled the meetings because it's proclaimed by the police so we're not talking about you know firebrands here okay the police say you're not allowed to have a meeting and the Sinn Féin club in OMA say okay so a moderate response they have icon confrontation, Dylan's OMA meeting, they don't challenge the authorities and it's the clerical and bourgeois control of the movement really that I'm talking about here. It's the Catholic middle class seeing what by the wind is blowing and trying to get a harness on this new movement and the church move with the people. Now this is in stark contrast to the behaviour of the Sinn Féin clubs in Kaliland. In Kaliland, this uh, dirty campaign of passive resistance. They eventually climb down, okay? They are served with an injunction not to hold the keely, and they hold the keely and they lock the place out, right? Then they hold an open air meeting and uh, they attack the police, 
right? And then gradually, whenever the, the, the general strike, anti conscription strike is called in April 1918, Killeen is the only place in Tyrone where the strike is enforced. And that basically means everybody had to close their shops, and if your shop wasn't closed, it was closed for you. So you can see the difference really within the same movement between very moderate members of Sinn Féin and Roma and the people who are coming from these. This is the Killeen uh, IRB, Irish Volunteer Force in 1916. Their take on Sinn Féin is slightly different, okay? And again, it's the difference between popular mobilisation, how ordinary people are engaged in this in perhaps a more radical way, and more moderate engagement in the organisation. So th this guy here is called Herbert Moore Pym, and he, he's, a, he's a very funny character. Uh, he had a pen name, A New Man, because he saw himself as a new man. Uh, he went from being a unionist to a nationalist, to a Republican, back to a Unionist, and he ended up as a Fascist. So he's, you know, he's left very few ideology, ideologies untouched. In 1916 he was in the Irish Republican Brotherhood. In 1917 he spoke in Throne to try and launch Sinn Féin amongst the Republicans. So what happens in Throne is Sinn Féin's formed in central and uh, south west Throne by a mixture of constitutional separatists, ordinary former Hibernians, and this, these Heliates. In East Tyrone, Sinn Féin is formed by the existing Republican community. And Pym says that this is not a party in the common conception of the word. Of the word. This idea by David Fitzpatrick about old wine decanted in new bottles, for these people engaged in this, this is very much a rejection of politics as was. This is very much a popular front movement, okay? There's a conscious rejection of Irish party style politics, democratic to a fault. They create an innovative campaign, they uh, retail fields, they engage. This is about breaking with the tradition where you delegate your political agency to an elected politician. The idea that every five years, as it is now, but it's not five years now, it's every two years, it's every year now, actually. In fact, the mo that liberal democratic politics is getting ahead of a lot more democratic, isn't it? Because we're voting every year. But it's the idea that you don't delegate your political agency to an elected politician and you let them do everything and then you come out the next time there's a vote and vote again and you don't bother with politics. It's the idea that you, enga you, you engage in political action. And the way that these people engaged in political action was through cooperatism, uh, food campaigns, anti conscription campaigns. Kayleys, they love Kayleys, drinking tea and dancing and learning Irish. And these were central elements of what a very fancy story would call quotidian activism. Every day coming together and engaging in political activism in order to try and fundamentally change the nature of society. Anybody who's been to some of my other talks, there's an awful lot of focus on, them, on trade unionism. Not all Sinn Féiners were trade unions. Trade union was very, very strong in Throne this period as well, between 1917 and 1920. There was a wave of strikes. This was a period when ordinary people felt that the potential for serious radical change was there and that they engaged in popular political activity to try and carry it out. This sits very awkwardly with the historiographical consensus about the Irish Revolution where, you know, nothing really changed. Nothing to see here. Don't be, you know, thinking about this period too much. So, uh, this sits, as I've said, in stark contrast to the social conservatism of the group that actually end up leading Sinn Féin. Now, you'll be glad to hear that I'm actually going to talk about history now. No. So there, there's a series of events, okay? So we've talked about the ideology, we've talked about the different groups, and now we're going to look at the way that the Irish party went from having this much support to this much support, and almost in direct correlation, Sinn Féin grew like this. And the key to understanding this, we've talked about the way that they formed clubs and how the clubs were formed. Key event in this is the death of John Redmond. John Redmond dies in March 1918. Sorry, yeah, March. And uh, his son, William Archer, is the MP for his throne. Okay? The Irish party have just suffered three election defeats to Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin is 
Sinn Féin wins an election in February 1917 in North, North Ross Common when there's no such thing as a Sinn Féin party. Count Plunkett, Count Noble Plunkett, the father of Joseph Plunkett, stands on an abstentionist ticket. There's no such thing as a Sinn Féin party. There's a group around Arthur Griffith that's called Sinn Féin, but this is not the thing that you know wins the election in 1918. By degree, then, a series of by-elections take place. McGuinness in South Longford, uh, Cosgrave in Kilkenny, and most famously, Eamon de Valera's by-election victory in Clare. And the Irish Parliamentary Party look like they're losing the political initiative. In the summer of 1917, July 1917, the new British Prime Minister, Lloyd George, well he's not so new, but he came in in December 1916. He, in order to placate American opinion and to gain American entry into the war on the side of Britain, sets up a thing called the Irish Convention. Sinn Féin boycott the Irish Convention because they abstain from everything. Okay? So there it is, we'll abstain from this, we do not give British recognition. The Irish Party go into the Convention to try and carve out some sort of a settlement. The Convention ends in acrimony and at the same time John Redmond dies heartbroken. The Irish Parliamentary Party has lost now four by-elections. It's facing into the political pre precipice and it plays a political game to try and use Ulster really as a safety valve. In January 1918, the Irish party win the South Armagh by election against Sinn Féin. The man who stands for Sinn Féin in South Armagh, Dr. Patrick McCart. Right. Now this is on the old vote, on the old franchise. So the representation of the People's Act, which was brought in after the end of the First World War, isn't enacted. There's a limited franchise of male householders. Okay. It's a close run thing, but the party wins comfortably. William Marcher Redmond resigns from his throne seat stands in his father's own constituency in Waterford, wins Waterford. And this man, TJ Hardison, is selected to stand for the party in East Row. Okay. The Hibernians are strong. This man has a proven track record. It's on the old electoral register. And this is another attempt to subvert Sinn Féin. The man who stands against them isn't Patrick McCartan. Now the reason why, although it's not written anywhere in a letter, the reason why Patrick McCartan doesn't stand in East Throne is because he lent his car to the UVF to do the Lauren Gunnelman in April 1914. Something that the Irish Parliamentary Party never stopped reminding Sinn Féin about in 1918. Okay? So that's why Pat McCartan didn't stand. Sean Milray from Calvinstead, or as he was called, Sean Sugar Sweet Milray, because he was a confectioner. Okay? And I think the thing was that he wasn't too sweet at all. Alright? So Harbison is chosen, and this is his platform. He says, he will preach the gospel of love and leave it to the Germans, Sinn Féin and the Bolsheviks. Remember the Bolsheviks had just had a revolution. The Harbison's really doesn't look like us doing Theresa May. Okay? So this is this is the this is the speed, alright? Ulster's very much still party territory. The Hibernians are strong. There are very good reasons for this, but I'm, I'm, if you can ask me questions about it because I know that I'm talking quite a lot. So why is he picked? He voted against partition. He voted against the party at St Mary's Hall. Remember the big vote about partition? He actually voted against the party, but stayed in the party. Alright? He was selected as a delegate to the Irish Convention, and the Irish Convention hadn't concluded by the date of the poll. It was about to conclude, but it hadn't concluded. So he had a national profile, and he was able to say, but he didn't actually say what was going on, because why that was going on but he had a national profile. He was the chief operator of the Hibernian movement in Cookstown. And Hibernianism remained strong in Cookstown really throughout the period. Now it suffers a lot, and we'll talk a wee bit about that uh, in a minute. And of course, the vote came out for the National Party because of sympathy for Redmond. All right? So what was the Sinn Féin argument here? Well, the Sinn Féin argument uh, touched on the same thing they talked about. This isn't actually the meeting in On Street, but De Valera and Countess Markovic come to On Street and they have a, a rally on the back of a break. All right? And he says, Sinn Féiners were not rebels because they were true to the only country to which they owed allegiance. The Irish party, if they wanted to masquerade under the flag, under any flag, they should masquerade under the Union Jack. And this was, the, the, the chief Sinn Féin argument was about 1916, the threat of conscription, and an attack on the Irish Parliamentary Party over partition. All right. Now, this Constant Markovic uh, also kept it again. Now, the, the, the rally was attacked 
by local orange men. It was also attacked by local Hibernians, so uh, Hibernians and orange men were cooperating. Okay. Sinn Féin sung Arl Navian. The Hibernians sung God Save Ireland. And there's a brilliant line in the newspaper where uh, Constance Markovich is staying in a hotel, so she's a bit eccentric, we'll put it like that. And she had a lap dog. All right? And she hid the Hibernians outside the hotel playing the boys of Waxford. And she thought they were Sinn Féiners. And she went right onto the window and started going, Oh, and your boys is gone! And cheering them and everything. And then the Hibernians phoned around and politely told her to get back into her hotel. But uh, what happens during this election is that in rural areas, in East Tyrone, you probably know the, the names in places like Clano, Kappa, Yalbley, from Rye, even up in Carrick Moor, when the Irish Party attempted to speak, local volunteers dispersed the Irish Party meetings okay, and attacked them. So it was a two way process. All right. Sinn Féin also go into areas and gain support in areas where there previously were no Irish volunteers or Irish Republican Brotherhood. And though, although they actually lose the election, the election is a very important step in the organisation of Sinn Féin locally. And a lot of national figures come to Tyrone to try and help with the election campaign. Now, Devlin, after the election, condemns these semi-armed invaders. These are the, the volunteers from all over Ireland who come up to try and help the election campaign. But the reality was there was like a there was a party of popular violence. In fact, 1918 wasn't really more violent than typical Westminster elections in Throne. There were reports about electoral rats in East Throne in particular because it was such a close constituency. <coughs> Going into some very lurid detail throughout the period, police charges, baton charges, people using knuckle dusters, revolvers, people die during election campaigns right throughout this period. Now the the conclusion Although Devlin wins on the limited franchise and Harbison's gains the seat, it's very much clear that he's lost his popular support base. So there's a difference between the people who can actually vote and the population. It's, an, it's a, a limited franchise, only about a quarter of what the franchise will be after 1918 because there's universal male suffrage and women over 30 get the vote in December 1918. So although they gain the victory, it's a lot closer than people think it would be. Now, there was an agreement between Unionists and Nationalists that there would be no contest during the war. So the Unionists didn't put up a candidate. It's unclear how much of Harbison's uh, victory was uh, because of Unionist sympathy and Unionist voting. It's clear that there wasn't the same extent of Unionist voting in East Rome that they honoured the political truth as there was in South Armagh previously. But there are some very good details. For instance, in our bowl, the local orange men lent the Hibernians their long bag drums to celebrate uh, Harveston's election victory, according to Alice McSly. So you could tell who the, the, the orange men wanted to win anyway. Now, so the East Rome by election is really important in terms of organisation. And then the Irish party is essentially completely undermined by events. The first event is the Irish Convention fails and the British government decided to implement conscription in Ireland. And the Irish Parliamentary Party, although they oppose conscription, have been telling people for years there's not going to be any conscription. <coughs> Sinn Féin have been telling people for years that there's going to be a conscription menace. And although both parties oppose conscription, Sinn Féin reaps the benefit in terms of popular support. <coughs> okay? There is a national campaign. Now, th this is, we mentioned there, there's a, uh, Places like Clannaboggan and Dromore and stuff, there's, there's very good primary evidence that some members of the Ulster well, Volunteer Force actually became Irish volunteers for a month until the conscription crisis abated and then went back to their uh, political homes. But this is John O'Hanrahan. This is John O'Hanrahan, who's a law partner of George Murnahan. And we'll see a big difference in terms of tone. This is a heliate. Under the, the, the context of the conscription crisis, he advised the people to get their guns ready and when the police and soldiers came to conscript them, they would be carried away on stretchers. So this is a former, very, very well, he's very moderate, and this is him speaking publicly now, he was arrested because of it, obviously, and put in jail. Uh, the RAC reported, the general result of this anti-conscription agitation has been the strengthening of the influence of the Sinn Féin party. This is the catalyst and the boost that Sinn Féin get locally, because they reap the benefit 
of the conscription crisis and the popular antipathy and opposition to conscription. And Kevin O'Sheen, uh, writing in a very long memoir in the Bureau of Military History, recalled that the military ring was naturally in the sentence, and that below the open political surface, the IRB men were working silently and efficiently in perfecting plans for local resistance should the attempt be made to reinforce the measure. So what happens because of conscription is that nationalist politics is radicalised and opposition to British rule becomes far more manifest and open and under these circumstances a lot more nationalists say to Sinn Féin. What the British government do after they draw back and don't implement conscription because it's quite clear the reason why they're implementing conscription is because of the Ludendorff offensive in March 1918 and they need more soldiers. But it would take more soldiers to enforce conscription in Ireland under these circumstances than they would actually gain by implementing conscription, so it would have been completely counterproductive. And they pull back. As revenge, they arrest the entire leadership, almost of Sinn Féin, in what's called the German plot. They say that the Sinn Féin leadership are in league with the Germans and they're going to have another rising, and they arrest them all. Because of this, Arthur Griffith is arrested. He's arrested and uh, he's sent to Lincoln. And while he's in jail, he stands for the new North West Rome constituency in the 1918 general election and he's elected. Okay? So, the, I keep referring back, coming forward, and then moving forward, but if you remember these different threads, one thread was anti imperialism, another thread was the Fenian tradition, and then there was a big argument about abstention. Abstention was the Irish Parliamentary Party and constitutional nationalism's strongest argument against Sinn Fein. Okay? There was an inherent communal respect for what they call the parliamentary wild geese. Right? People used to read the parliamentary reports from the newspaper, gather around and listen to, you know, to somebody giving a blood and thunder speech in the Commons, attacking the British government. This Irish literature of this period is sprinkled with in Irish and in English. It's a very funny thing in Shaw Regain is uh, and Drummond Moore, the far down in California, like from the Gisperathians and Farmers, like writing out the parliamentary debates. So, uh, S. Joe O'Connor, this is the Constitutional Separatist, argued when he was joining Sinn Féin that abstention would be ruinous and would be suicidal. He didn't agree with abstention when he, went, when he joined Sinn Féin. Joe Devlin said that it creates an orange platform in the House of Commons. If the Irish MPs pull out of the Commons, they leave the Commons and the Irish question to the Unionists. This was, and Sinn Féin were saying, no, we can't recognise. <laughs> Now Sinn Féin's counter-proposal, which Arthur Griffith cooked up, was that Sinn Féin would, rather, would appeal to a higher court of arbitration, the peace conference after the war. Now he came up with this when the Germans were doing quite well, but after the war the British won, won the, the conflict and the peace conference didn't want to hear from Sinn Féin. But this was more or less a device to deflect uh, criticism of abstention. But this is, the, this is the key, and this is the key, to the conscription crisis in this respect. Impotent, left impotent by the conscription crisis, the Irish Parliamentary Party pulled out of Westminster in April 1918 and they adopt their own form of abstention. And all their talk about, you know, you have to attend Westminster falls flat in its face because it looks like a tense of Westminster under the circumstances is pointless. And it actually does a lot of work, heavy lifting for Sinn Féin. And it, this, is, this is key. Uh, it's very hard to use the, the results in Tyrone to give it a proper gauge of the difference in support between the Irish Parliamentary Party and Sinn Féin. Because for fear that the vote would be split, again we're coming back to very contemporary issues here, uh, there was an electoral pact. So there is a history of constitutional nationalists doing electoral pacts with Republicans. All right. T.J. Harbison, Tyrone used to have four constituencies, north, south, east and west. Under the revision of the Redistribution Act and under the Representation of the People's Act, it was changed to three. North West Tyrone, North East Tyrone and South Tyrone. Okay. South Tyrone was a safe union of seat uh, and it was the MP for, for uh, South Tyrone was William Coote. Okay. Under what was called the Low Pact, Harbison got keeping a seat in North East Tyrone. And Griffith stood in North West Rome. So it's, you can't really use those seats to try and work out what the uh, breakdown in support was in 1918. But this is the pledge that Harbison had to sign 
before he was allowed to stand and before Sinn Féin agreed to pull out of the contest, he says, he would support the claims of Ireland as an independent nation to unrestricted self-determination and to support Ireland's appeal for such to the peace conference. That's a long, long way and a long sort of uh, course of travel for TJ Harbison and it's a condition that he has to fulfil in order to be able that Sinn Féin won't stand against him. This is, now, the, 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 the reason why this slides here is because Sinn Féin and the Irish party stand against each other in South Throne because they can't win the seat. And you can see the difference in the votes. John, Dennis McCullough stands for Sinn Féin, he has 5,435. John Skeffington, 2,602. Uh, could all, all told got about 9,000 votes. So you're talking about a, the electorate was quadrupled really in this election. But you can see that the balance has clearly shifted in those 12 months from the start of 1918 to the end of 1918 and the thing that changes this, that accelerates this process is the conscription crisis. By May 1921, when it, uh, with the beginning of the Northern Parliament, okay, Tyrone is a single constituency, Coote and the Unionists get 45% of the vote, Harvison stands, it's proportional representation, you can stand whenever you want, and you can see the Sinn Féin of Eclipse really the parliamentary party in Tyrone, very much on the scale of the eclipse of parliamentary nationalism across the island. The difference with Tyrone obviously is that you have a sizable segment of the population that don't adhere to nationalism of any kind. Right? I want that. Now, I just really, really wrecked. Well, no, 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 I just, uh, I'll, very quickly then, uh, what, what are the conditions, so the, the, the big argument here, and uh, what I've tried to do is, I've tried to present the main elements in through nationalism in 1916. I've talked about the breaking up of one political consensus that had been formed in the 18, period 1879 to about 1886, and the way that a new going to talk about Angelic Irish, because that, that's one of the chief planks of the Sinn Féin platform, because Namara women. Because Sinn Féin was very, very different from the Irish Constitution, the Irish Parliamentary Party, because they, because they engaged an awful lot of women. Right? Now you usually get this line, oh sure, was in contest Markovic, the first female MP. We're not talking about that, we're talking about Sinn Féin clubs, where women and men are an equal footing, and where women are chief organisers and have a very, very important political role in the organisation. And we're talking about the Irish language <coughs> as the way Hibernians with the glue and Hibernianism and marching up and down and wearing funny shashes and hats and bonners and stuff was the glue that held constitutionalism together. For this brief period, the Gaelic League and the Irish nationalism and Cayleys and classes and stuff was almost like the social glue that held the Sinn Féin thing together. It was very, very difficult to understand this without talking about this. And the novelty of it, female engagement in politics is one of the most novel aspects of it. The Sinn Féin really, in terms, the Gaelic League is the first mass organisation in Irish history where women have an equal status to men. You can move or push it and say maybe they weren't that equal, but at the level of branches and committees and even representation all up in the organisation, women had their place and it was a place with men. It wasn't, you know, they were in a separate room or a separate committee. Now within the military aspects of republicanism, they were separated. There was the common man and the Oakley Nair and the Irish volunteers. But in Sinn Féin as a political organisation, they were mixed. When everybody was a burden, what I mean by a burden, they were Irish. Agency was had down in Shirley, but then Sinn Féin took over, and the men, men and women were in it. And the Gaelic League. Do you think that the Gaelic League was important? Gaelic League, you know, had an influence. So, very briefly, Mass 
conversion of former Hibernians, these constitutional separatists. Women involved in an organisation and the, the Irish language is a vehicle for it. Now, I'm not going to read all this out these, but this is a report by a very famous Gaelic war uh, about uh, the, the state of the Irish language in Throne in 1916. So it's all Padraig O'Connor. Padraig O'Connor, if you haven't heard of him, he's the people at the Armagh where he took the head off in the statue in Galway a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, he toured the country, walked the entire country, checking on the Irish language, and he went through the different parishes. So it's all Giltach your own, from Giltach. And he's saying there's four parishes where Irish is alive, Kirkmore, Greencastle, uh, that's near uh, Craigan and uh, and then Gorchy, cut the body farm, cut the townlands, okay? So uh, Greencastle, schoolmaster, very, very loyal to the language, and the parish priest is old but favourable to Irish, and he goes through it all. And he says that Irish is alive amongst dirty people, but there's no political organisation that he actually attack now. He says in, in Carrickmore, in the, the village, and Gruganach, it's a leading volunteer. He's the man who set up, who was the manager of the creamery, the cooperative creamery in Kepmore. And far short, who was very sympathetic to republicanism. They were involved, but the, 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 the village was in the Galtop. There was no Irish in the village. In the townlands, he says the priests were against the language. And he says the volunteers even were against the language. He says, Loris Fishtad Nagilagal, the Sagar, the Gazidji, the Spider Gavati, Christi Kantar, the Kurabun, the spirited wise, spirited and wise Nadini Hain. There's great spirit amongst the people themselves. Tomas Akur and Yelig, well, it's your second name, Yelig. The respect for Irish language, the way in Kiyaku, the only screwers son. If they had the opportunity or the way, they would do things for its benefit. Talot politiata lager sakanta. Politics, the political class are very strong in the region. Akas trul lum nakul gilaka comfort and oglak on na mas kart aku erti ak ek fogan aku. The people who are in charge of politics have no respect for the Irish language. This is what he's saying. Okay? Now, in reality, what happens because of Sinn Féin, the people who are in charge of politics develop an enormous respect for the Irish language. Now, I've actually, man, that this is, I mixed these up. So, this is a report from Drumore, which was outside the Gale Talk in 1920. <coughs> okay, this is from a Chimera, a Gaelic mm -hmm. teacher, a man called Peter O'Donnell, or Peter Donnelly, who's from Drumore. And these are the things he did every day to promote the Irish language, and I'm not going to read them all out, but believe you me, there was stuff happening in Drumore where there wasn't even, but in Kilscarry there was a branch of the Gaelic League and Father Maguire was there. But by 1920, a place where there was no real engagement in the Gaelic League, where there was no Gael talk, the Gaelic League was flourishing, and clubs and committees were taking place all the time. Being taught in schools, Gaelies, classes, you're talking about a level of activity on a daily basis that, you know, is, is quite unprecedented. This is November 1920, the 20th of November 1920. Okay? This is when Sinn Féin have achieved their level of support. This is when Sinn Féin have achieved control of Throne County Council. This is when it's at its high point. Now, what happened to this? Well, this says what happened to it. It was essentially destroyed. This is the report of Peter Donnelly for the 7th of Thursday, the 7th of April 1921. two cousins were murdered brutally yesterday. I can't do anything since. No, neither Sagam Kahanachanak cast the best me. I don't know when I will be able to do anything. Masha and Kid Dana for Court Natur, I'm the person who found the three bodies. Ganyani Jia Trokara, or Ananamaha, Agus, or Wash Lav J, Garushit, we got a mission this old and then in the palm of God's hand. So these are three <coughs> volunteers who were taken out of their moor on that night and executed in the roadside by the Ulster Special Constabulary. And essentially what happens is, is that, and you looked at the graph about Griffith is that this uh, 
sort of explosion of popular mobilisation is clamped down on. And it's clamped down on between the period of 1921 and 22 with the establishment really of uh, the Northern Administration. And it's very much in the news at the minute about respect for Irish and the politicising Irish. Irish was essentially always a very political issue. And this, the, 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 the escalation of violence on both sides in Throne between 1921 and 1922 leads to the sort of extinction of this type of uh, quotidian daily mobilisation Cayley's classes because it's frowned upon. Okay, and it's it's stamped up, it's stamped down. Now th th this there's also a, an impression really that there's there's a strict divide line between Sinn Fein and the Irish Volunteers here. And that to be in the Irish Volunteers or Sinn Fein is somehow to be engaged in military activity. The Sinn Fein Club in Cookstown was led by women and volunteers and engaged in no real military activity at all. Now well, there were many clubs in the town. Were there? Were, were there? Yeah, right, 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 right. Do you remember any Sinn Féin clubs in Dungannon? Well, I don't remember any Sinn Féin clubs in Dungannon. Well, there were Sinn Féin clubs in Dungannon. Well, there were Sinn Féin clubs in Dungannon. And there would meet St. Patrick's Hall. And, uh, Who all was involved in that mother business? Who would be involved in it? Who were the Sinn Féin in the town? They lived in Sinn Féin at the time, I suppose. There are those who were arrested and, and then they were arrested again. And they were jailed in Barry Kinder. And it was a whole the surgeons of the people and their Sinn Féin clubs all over, but they were what you would call them, the people, the men and women were in them, and uh, the boys of course were on the run, and they were going from here to there, and the rest the food. So, I, I, I'll finish this because I'm, I'm kind of ripping the back side of this. But uh, the, 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 the point here is that uh, that Maud and Inglis, that was 96, whenever she gave that interview. But if you go back into the historical record and you look what these people wrote about themselves, you will see that the be in Sinn Féin was not about voting in an election. Certainly, to be in the Sinn Féin movement was not to be one of the boys, as Maud and Inglis talking about and she called them boys because her brothers were in the volunteers. To be in the Sinn Féin movement was to be part of something broader than that. And the best example of this really is Cookstown, which was not a very, well, as most of you know, wasn't a Republican stronghold and even the nationalists in Cookstown were predominantly Hibernian. But there was, through this period from 16 to, to 21, 22, witnessed a growth of the Sinn Féin movement in Cookstown. And the people who led it were, uh, that's James Nain, who was a solicitor's clerk. That's William Donnelly, who was a butcher, and that's Alice Donnelly, his sister. Okay, and these people, this is actually the foot, now they're, they're incredibly happy looking, they're actually being interned. Okay, in May 1822. They, they're all these specials. <laughs> and they got their photograph took before they were put in the prison ship or Agenda. Alex, Alice wasn't put on the Agenda. But if you look at the activism and the political acumen and the way that Alice viewed her political activism, you get some sort of an idea about how active these people were in politics and the, the different things they did. And the reason why, and it's, it's quite, it's not funny, the reason why we know so much about these people is because Alice didn't realise that there was a censor on the prison ship Argenta. And she sent those letters to William that he never read. But the censor read them and he kept them in a big file. And the big file sent them Belfast. And you get all these different insights about what life was like and what they were doing in Sinn Féin and, and so uh, the lorry was at our house and that it was I, the police were after 
I need not go into any further details. All I can say is you chaps know nothing about being searched. Nothing incriminating was found, so I, I'm here to write you for a while yet. And she's talking about life in Cookstown after the clamp down, really. And she's talking about William uh, from Alice, about Johnny. This is talking about getting out of prison. I think the, uh, this is how she describes Cookstown. I believe I prefer the Argenta to this accursed hole. I'm absolutely sick of it here. So I wouldn't mind if they uh, tethered to Mono Aiken tomorrow. If they tethered me to Mono Aiken, Mono Aiken is, Frank, uh, is a leading Republican moment in Susan Teal. So she's talking about her experience at Cookstown, and she also goes back and she talks about what it did. And what, what, what she sends to William in, on the prison ship Argenta are fags and Irish grammar books. So it's... Uh, now, uh, uh, there, there's more there, but obviously we'll, we'll finish with, with a couple of snippets. Uh, this was a point actually about, the, and this is one of the, the perhaps, <coughs> points I didn't address, was the relationship between Sinn Féin and Catholicism. When Sinn Féin was a non-sectarian organisation that didn't get an awful lot of support, particularly from the local charta. Okay, and then whenever the civil war kicked in and there was, it was a difference between Republicans and Treatyites, the church stood very strongly with the treaty. But a lot of these people were profoundly Catholic in their faith. Okay, and uh, the, 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 I'll finish with a couple of clips of Mother Bendigas. I just think they're quite poignant and a good way to f finish the talk. Really, they suffered. Yeah. And I'll tell you who suffered. The people at home. Okay. My mother suffered. They all suffered. But it's forgotten. And I suppose maybe they've won something for Ireland. But I wonder what kind of an Ireland had way at the moment. What about the faith? What about the morals? All these men lived good lives. They were all of them. By the way, that's Cathy Bonnie Cleary, Thomas Clark's wife, and that's a visit she gave them again in 1968 to the local GA club. And there's actually another brilliant interview of Cathy Clark. Father Louis O'Kane and Mother Benignus Button in and Tanu O'Kane, he hasn't got it right in uh, the Cardinal of the Archive. It's really, really brilliant uh, interview. Now, the, the last slide, and so you, again, not to over egg the button, then these people were not all Bolsheviks like Leon Trotsky, they were all atheists and they weren't trying to set up a communist Republican throne or anything like that there. But there was clearly something going on that a lot of the history books appear to have lost over in terms of this level of popular activism and popular politics. And I think it's it's a natural inclination amongst a lot of historians in terms of the view of the high, the school of high politics. The politics and history is viewed very much from the perspective of the big house or the parliament and statesmen. And there's clearly these are these people make decisions of seismic importance. But there's also a subaltern history of ordinary people's engagement in, in, in history and I think a lot more uh, focus should be placed on it. But I'll, I'll finish with the uh, another wee snippet from Mother Benignus, uh, and it's the it's a the, uh, I've called it the unfinished revolution. This is basically a, a, an old woman looking back on the period uh, and reflecting really, and it's. We're all There's nothing to gain and everything to lose. And they did their best. And the time is, now it is. It's a different story. And politicians, north and south, I don't know what about any of them. I suppose the people are turning. But you want an honourable peace 
an honorable settlement and I want an iron free from north to south and east to west, one and all divided, and that is the threat, and that is what it has been deprived of. So, uh, now, the warning that obviously is that you're dealing with highly biased sources, but that the power, I think, of commentary, even people with, who are looking back on a long period, is you get any, a subjective idea of what it was like, or the way that people remembered the period, that isn't in a state record, or isn't in, you know, very, very dry material. And if you combine them, if you look at primary sources and oral testimony, I think you get a richer picture of uh, what's going on at the time, particularly the picture of ordinary people who were engaged in the thing. Uh, Gracie Kelly, as she was called, was only a young girl really when these events were going on, but it's, I think she sheds light on dark spaces in the record and fills in, gives you an impression of what it was like that you're not going to get really in dealing with newspapers or police reports. So overall then, and we'll finish on this. What I hope to have achieved tonight was to give you some sort of impression, no matter how scatterbrained and confusing it was, about how one political consensus, which had been built a generation earlier in a very revolutionary circumstance, fell apart really under revolutionary strain, under a crisis, and how an alternative consensus was built up in which there were forces and different groups sometimes working with each other, sometimes working against each other. And that, to me, I think is, is the, the key and the best way to try and understand the revolution in Tyrone. Thanks very much.